I, I think really it began when I began thinking about the Romantics. That's when it happened. You see, I began thinking about German Romantic thinkers at the end of the 18th century. That, I think, is when the, the, I conceived the idea clearly, first of all. You see, I realized that they made a considerable, they administered a considerable blow to something which was the central philosophy of the West, namely, that to all genuine questions there must be an answer. If there is no answer to the question, the question cannot be real. That there the, the can only be one true answer to any question. All the other questions must be false. One good, many bad. You'll find that in Spinoza, Plato, and anybody else you like to think of. And that war had been fought about that, on that principle well, and that belief. The question was how to find the answers. Now, about that, there were differences. About the differences, wars were fought. Some people thought you did it by, I don't know, reading sacred texts, and others thought it done by democratic votes and various other possibilities. And, of course, since salvation ultimately rested on being able to discover the answer, how should we live, wars were naturally fought about the central method for the discovery of this all-important truth. The question was, what is the method? Well, that has never been settled. And that remains, for those who believe that, still an open question. But I thought that I wondered at some point whether this could be valid. The idea being this, when you've discovered all the answers, maybe you never will, but when you have, or if you have, then all the true propositions must be compatible with each other. Because you can't, one truth cannot be inconsistent with another truth. That is an a priori proposition. When you have attained to that, then life will become perfect. Because you cannot follow a life which you know to be based on untruth. That, I think, has been the center of a great deal of human thought, from Plato to the positivists of our own time. And still, I guess, is, is a is tried a very consistent idea in, in, in our world today. Is a lot of people world. believe it. Yeah. A lot of people believe it. It was believed in the Middle Ages, it was believed by Jews and Christians, it was believed by in the Renaissance, it was believed in the 18th century. In fact, it is a central presupposition of the central tradition of Western thought. But it's interesting, you write in one of your essays that the one reading that really made you think about this logical impossibility was reading Tolstoy, War and Peace. Because Tolstoy was for you a figure who tried, who struggled with, 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 his, with the incompatibility of his experience as a novelist, of how the human condition is, and his firm belief that there was an I ultimate answer. truth. Yes, well, that's, I did, when I, I read an essay on Tolstoy quite early in life, I think about 1850 or so, and I suddenly realized in reading Tolstoy's famous appendix, The War and Peace, which everybody thinks is unnecessary, and does the thing, a thing of piece of, I don't know, autodidactic philosophy, which Tolstoy stuck on this great novel quite unnecessarily, rather a boring piece of homemade philosophy, but which I believe to be a very brilliant essay well worth examining. In that essay, he more or less says that we don't know that the important questions for us don't appear to have obvious answers. But he thinks he's discovered them. If you live according to Christ's teaching, that is the answer to how human beings should live. He didn't believe in the divinity of Christ, but he believed that Christ was the best man who ever lived and that he knew the truth. Well, if you read Tolstoy's novels, this does not emerge. They are entirely filled with very different characters who don't agree with each other, all of whom have ideals. All the ideals are genuine ideals, and the genuine ideals clash. And the whole of his writing is largely founded upon the inevitable tragedy of these collisions. Not every value clashes with every other value. Only some do. Not every value is of the same 
the same status as other values. Some do come below others, but in general, there isn't a single universal table along which you can place these values in a certain definite hierarchy, so that you always know what is more important than what, which value comes above which. Because the ultimate values, which a great many of us are addicted to, whether we know it or not, appear to me both to be incompatible and to be incomparable. Which means we cannot say, for instance, that life nowadays is better than life uh, in in ancient Greece or in, in the medieval times? Well, or? I would say that, yes. I would say the cultures are different, the values are different, and therefore to say we are... But, but the idea of progress as a continuous movement seems to be a fallacy. That's an important uh, proposition because we still think that we are at the end of some continuous line of development. It's a terrible heresy. Well, there is a line of development, but not of progress. So if one say that uh, people for slavery or um, some uh, other human condition at, in ancient time was obviously a worse uh, condition than the condition we live under now. Oh, we can say that. We can say that. We can. Uh, we certainly, um, we ourselves, live by certain values. There is some kind of constellation of values in terms of which we live our lives. And if something contradicts that constellation or is not compatible with it, we reject it. And that is what we mean by saying slavery is wrong. But at the same time, if we want to understand what slavery was, we have to understand the world in which there were slaves and why these people were not shocked. And then you realize the enormous difference between their outlook and our outlook. And if you then say, which outlook is superior? I find it difficult to say that entire outlooks, whole cultures, can be strung along a line in which we say this culture is better than that one. In one instance, you asked the question, why couldn't we go back to the medieval times, uh, provided we knew exactly how life was at that time? I think you mentioned the 14th or 15th century. Uh, what is it that prevents us to recreate a certain epoch, even if we knew everything seemingly knew everything about it. And you have an interesting answer to that. No, 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 we can't do that. We can't do that. We are what we are. We live in the world in which we live. We can't transform ourselves into creatures whose values are different from ours. You can't say to yourself, let me drop all my present values and sink myself into a different world which I think I understand. That would be a highly artificial act and it would be a failure. Because there is a large amount of things about human beings in different periods that we don't know anything about. We don't. That, of course, but even if we did, supposing we were omniscient, supposing we knew everything, even then, to say, I reject the entire world in which I live, I sink myself into an earlier world about which I know everything. I am a 15th century man. No other 15th century man would recognize you as one. And of course, bringing this, this idea into present at life, we cannot go into another individual or another way of thinking of... Well, things are what they are, let me tell you. The greatest, best of all remarks made by the English Bishop Butler at the beginning of the 18th century. He said, things are what they are and not another thing. And also, things are what they are and their consequences will be what they will be. Why then should we seek to be deceived? And not to make this sound as a truism, which it could, what is the, the implication of, 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 of just saying this for our, under, the, the, our thinking, our understanding of ourselves that, that is so provocative, which it is? Well, I, I suppose the fact that we cannot construct the idea of a perfect world, which if only it could be built would be the world we, we seek. A great many philosophers have thought that there was an ideal form of life. Maybe we are, can't, can't reach it because it's too difficult. Maybe we haven't got the means. Maybe we are too stupid to understand what it is. Maybe we, um, we, we aren't ripe. Maybe we're too, too, too uncivilized to be able to grasp all its implications. But somebody must know what it is. If we don't know it, the angels knew it.
If the angels did, did, didn't know it, maybe Adam in paradise knew it. If he didn't know it, God knows it. But somebody must be able to know the answers to these questions, even if we don't. And that I believe to be untrue. Was, was it Karl Marx who said that the, the role of the philosophers now is not to explain the world, but to change the world? He did say, not for our oh, yes. And you would say, what is the role of the philosopher? To understand. What? To, un to understand. If he wants to change because he understands, nothing is to prevent him. But main task of philosophy is to enter into the states of mind of people who have thought certain thoughts who believe certain beliefs. The main purpose of philosophy is to understand. Of course, philosophy wants the truth. And for me, there are, let me see, let me qualify what I say. I think I'm being, you've provoked me into being rather extreme. There are certain propositions, certain values, if you like, which a great many people, at a great many times, in a great many places, have believed and have accepted. And that makes communication between different cultures possible. Some people think these things are a priori. Some people think these are so-called um, values which are given to us by God or by our own conscience, 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 or by whatever it may be. That I don't believe. I do not believe in the possibility of discovering anything, any factual truth a priori. But there are certain quasi-universal truths, which most people have lived in the light of. And that is why they are not strange to us. If there were people who really did not accept these basic propositions, we wouldn't understand them, and we wouldn't think they were human. So there is, there is something common to all human beings and all cultures, but it is not guaranteed. It is not a priori. It is not what is called what um, philosophers have tried to call um, um, Ul ultimate or universal or universal ultimate may maybe universal yes called semper quod ubique quod omnibus that's a medieval phrase that which is everywhere which is, which is always which is accepted by all that not because that's too strong because you have this belief in 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 values that are after all common to humans. Uh, I, I guess this is you call yourself a liberal, uh, but um, at the same time there are unsettling implications for liberalism in what you are saying, uh, because liberalism, is a, liberalism has often, almost often, almost always presumed a free choice of the individual, uh, the freedom to choose uh, rationally at least. No, I think that um, people are free to choose irrationally. Yes, but then they could freedom choose in freedom. a liberal society, and then... But freedom is freedom. Freedom means you choose what you choose, not necessarily rationally. If you're a rational being, or want to be rational, or believe in reason, then of course you choose what it is rational to choose. But if you choose not to be rational, if you choose to gamble, when you choose well, which horse is going to win, and you have no reason for thinking it, you just enjoy the act of gambling, that is not rational choice. But it is choice. And you say this is a, this is a choice that must be in, in a liberal society. Well, I think it is a choice that must be to be human at all. So I what think if people can't choose, they're not quite human. But if a human being, and you also indicate that, choose something that will reduce his freedom of choice, or actually choose a lifestyle which does not entail many choices, or actually uh, does away with, with choices altogether. Well, you mean, no, it doesn't do away, do away with choice. Nothing does away with choices. No, Non-choosing human beings are not human. But if you enter a monastery or, or, um, or submit to a very harsh military regime and you feel happy about that, then you have... The choice is limited, but there is still choice. You've chosen it, and you could unchoose it. You could stop. And you wouldn't say that that is a worse choice or value-wise a lesser choice than a choice? Depends on what you want to choose. I don't want to judge this. If you choose to live in a monastery or be a um, soldier obeying orders, that is your, your right. You choose what you choose. You may find that you are suffocated by it. I would. But if you're not, if you feel yourself entirely realized by that kind of life, so be it. 
But cannot the outcome then be that uh, human humans will choose by consecutive choices of this kind in a liberal way uh, of organizing human life? Oh yes, that's what I believe in. I mean, I want the choices to be what I call liberal choices. I believe that um, that um, there is a form of some forms of life which are superior to other forms of life. I think that liberal society is superior to a dictatorship or to a, 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 a communist state or to a Nazi state. I believe that because that's how I live. Those are my values. I haven't, I haven't chosen them. They've chosen me to a large degree. I mean, I inherit them because I am what I am. I live where I live. And no doubt, this is what I find myself believing. I can change my beliefs, but I start from a ready-made set of them. That can't be avoided. But if liberalism or liberal values is the choice, a choice of yours or a choice of certain circumstances, then there might be a conflict between liberalism and value pluralism, which is the logical condition in which we, we exist, according to you. I don't understand. Why is there a conflict? Because value pluralism, which says uh, there is no hierarchy of values, yeah. might uh, lead to values uh, taking command that are incommensurable with liberalism. They might, but in that case, I would have to fight them. You will. Oh, yes. That's why I'm, I'm, we're perfectly we go, we're right to go to war against Hitler, because his values did not coincide with ours. No. But what I'm saying is that liberalism is then not a condition uh, c coming out of value pluralism. No, no. That's, That's what I meant. different things. You could have, um, you could have a no value pluralism and still have liberalism. You could have a set of, of um, given values, one of which was liberalism, coherent with everything else. This could be the case. More than that, you could have a tyrannical liberalism. If you are not a liberal, you, if they are in the liberal regime, could imprison you. Give me an example of that. What, how, could, how could a liberal regime be tyrannic? Well, why shouldn't it be? If you say, the, our philosophy is liberalism. That is to say, people should be permitted to do certain things. They should be they're allowed to do anything which doesn't harm other people. And how can that be tyrannic? No, so then you might say, anybody who disagrees with this must go to jail. I mean, uh, Catholics, um, fascists, communists, all kinds of people, Indian gurus, heaven knows who. Somebody says, no, that is not right. But doesn't that liberalism is, presume a, a certain ultimate hierarchy of values where freedom of choice, the freedom of the human being to, through choice, uh, create or recreate himself, is an ultimate value that has to yes, be placed above so. other values. I think that is so. I think that is. Mind you, there are two sets of the word choice, which I think I have to distinguish. One is the basic choice, that means which makes human beings human. I can always either do something or refrain from doing it. Even if I'm tied to a, to a tree with ropes, I can choose, so to speak, to not to fidget or not to want to be free or, or choose to think about other things. But to be tied to a tree is not to be free. And therefore, there is another sense of choice. Which choice means how many doors are open by, for me to enter by. That is a political choice. That's different from basic choice. Basic choice is a psychological presupposition of being a human being, not a robot. So you would ultimately then say uh, that, uh, that your idea of value pluralism uh, is still based on, an, on a value, the value which is, entails the human, be, uh, the choice. New, human choice. Well, exactly, that, because otherwise, otherwise you couldn't choose between one, one value and another. So. Out of the crooked timber of humanity, as you like to quote Kant, from which nothing straight can be made, there is a kernel within that is uh, consistently human. What, what, what it is to be, to, to be human? When would you say then a person is not human? I will give you an example for somebody who really isn't human. Supposing you met a man who, let us say, I know. There is a man who goes about plunging knives into other people. 
and you say to him, why do you do this? He says, because it gives me pleasure. And you say, but you know, it hurts these people. And the man says, yes, but uh, what of it? And then you say, but, you know, if you do it to them, they might do it to you. No, they won't, because I'm stronger than they are. I can defend myself. They can't defend themselves, so I do it to them. So far, you can understand what has happened. Sadism is something which we recognize as a possible human condition. But now the conversation goes on. And you say, but why do you enjoy plunging knives into them? He said, because it causes them pain? No. <laughs> My reason is I like putting knives into resilient surfaces, like people's skin. So if I give you a tennis ball, you put your knife into that, would that give you equal pleasure? Yes. Makes no difference whether you cause pain to human beings or kill them or just put a knife into some other resilient surface. I don't see what you mean, man says. Of course, I told you. What I like is plunging knives into resilient surfaces. Then you don't understand how such a man can do, can think what, what his world is, what his values are. I think we begin to say communication is broken down. I can't go on. I can't discuss it any further. That's a very generous definition of, of what it is to be. No, but if he thinks that giving pain to people is of no importance whatever, doesn't matter. Not that it gives him pleasure, but it's of no importance. It makes no difference. Tennis ball or human being can't see the difference. If someone says that, then his universe is so different from mine that I have to say he's not a human being in my sense. But do you, would you argue that all humans then are able to communicate uh, with each other? All humans should be able or are able yes, to communicate yes. That's what makes you human. Yes. Communication must be possible. Because there are these common values. I mean, everybody believes in truth. Because if you didn't have truth, you couldn't live. Because then, if lies were told, you didn't know what to expect in the future. Everybody has to eat. Everyone has to drink. Everyone has to have a certain amount of sex or exercise. These things are common. If you cross these things out, people cease to communicate. So the kernel of the crooked timber of humanity, you would say, is this ability to, or, or what is it, propensity to choose, or, or how would you say, you have to kind of... More than that, propensity to choose and a certain number of common values in terms of which human beings can communicate, knowing that they're understood. My madman who puts knives into tennis balls doesn't understand why you, why you ask um, what's the difference between a tennis ball and a human being. You see, I can only talk to people who understand what I mean. However different their morality is from mine, they must be able to understand a certain minimum. Isn't this quite close to saying that there are universal values after all, albeit in conflict oh, with yes. each other. Oh yes, oh yes. I don't deny universal values. I merely say there is no abs and there are no absolute values. There is no a priori reason for thinking these must exist. These are values which um, you, for which there's no evidence, which are simply given to one in a kind of revelation, in the way the Bible does, or in the way in which other religions communicate them. I discover these values empirically. I discover that all human beings have to have this. Otherwise, they are not human. They can't communicate. So there's no way that these universal values can be changed by people choosing uh, generation after generation in a oh, way yes, that... Oh, yes, they might change. I can't guarantee anything. I can guarantee nothing. I'm again, guarantees are a way of denying experience as the only measure. Negative and positive freedom are political terms. I was only talking about political freedom, no other kind. And all I said then, which has been much misunderstood, is that there are two senses of the word free. One is, am I being tied to a tree? Then I'm not free, because I can't move. If I'm in jail, I can't get out. And freedom means not being in jail, not being tied to a tree, being able to do not necessarily what I want, that's something different. There being a lot of doors through which I could march, and none of them is locked. The more doors are locked, the less free I am. Of course, some doors have to be locked because there are other values. 
because there is security, there is happiness, there is knowledge, there is science, all kinds of other things which are just as important as freedom. But freedom means that. Then the second sense of freedom, positive freedom, is the question, the answer to the question, who is master? Am I the master or does somebody order me about? These freedoms don't clash. They are both freedoms, There's both senses are perfectly correct, and they can both be obtainable. They, they are both perfectly ultimate values. But all I said in that essay, which was much attacked on freedom, was that positive freedom has been more perverted than negative freedom. Both can be perverted. When people talk about laissez-faire, and therefore allow little children to die in mines because their parents have a right, because they're free to let you have them, and you have a right to employ them. And what we do, that is a perversion of the notion of negative freedom. But, but if somebody says, I alone know what is good for you, you do not know what is good for you, and therefore I force you to do certain things which if you were as clever as me, you would see for yourself. But if you don't see, it's because you're stupid, and I have to force you to do something for your own benefit. That is the every tyrant has said that. Historically, of course, this abuse of positive freedoms have been quite, uh, quite obvious in communism, in various fascist uh, societies. All tyrannies. Do you, have you seen this kind of abuse lurking also in modern uh, welfare society, or would you say that uh, that has been a proper balance? No, I think it's proper. No, I believe it. No, no, that is the proper balance. I would not take that. If you ask me what my views are, and you haven't asked me that, but supposing you were to ask me that, I would say, roughly speaking, the New Deal. Was a good balance. Was a good balance. And then, roughly speaking, also the modern post-war European welfare state. Yes. Now, yes. uh, if you look at the world today and the, the, the new surge of liberal thought, or some would even say laissez-faire liberalism, uh, do you see any danger of abusing negative liberties or going too far in that? In oh, the yes, certainly. If, if negative liberties negative liberty leads me to allow the poor to starve to death, that won't do. If negative liberty leads me to ignore the needs of all kinds of other people, provided I am allowed to sit in a room and listen to gramophone records and take no part in political life, that is a perversion. Do you, think, do you see uh, 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 these kind of tendencies uh, coming back into, into so modern oh, yes. society? Oh, yes, I do. I think, I think Mrs. Thatcher believed in negative freedom to an excessive extent. Mm. And that led her to ignoring all kinds of human needs, which the modern state ought to be able to provide for. Is it perhaps even a modern rationalize, uh, 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 r rational uh, utopia or rationalistic utopia lurking behind uh, laissez-faire liberalism in implying that if we deregulate on a global basis such and such, we will reach a, a, a state of bliss of a new Maybe country. that's what they believe. If so, they're wrong. But do you see, have you, have you noticed that kind of beliefs? Yes, I think there is an element <coughs> of utopianism in in, in laissez-faire liberalism. In other words, if the market is the only criterion for the rationality of human action, that kind of thing, then I think if only you allow people to stop interfering with each other, people to stop believing in all kinds of principles which make them try and govern other people's lives, or and so on, if that happened, everything would be all right. Anarchists believe that. And that is utopia. And there is an affinity between laissez-faire liberalism and, and, and anarchy in that well, sense. Well, anarchism is a very extreme form of liberalism. It is a slight, slightly lunatic form of liberalism. It hasn't gone too far. Obviously, we, we have already seen in, in, modern, in the modern society reactions to this kind of, of development. We have uh, all kinds of nationalistic, fundamentalistic, uh, movements uh, coming coming uh, back into 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 the, onto the stage in that way is history uh, not repeating itself but would, would you see the same patterns in in modern day protests of various kinds but which and the and the early 19th century protests against 
I mean, a, a global, the global economy against the European Union, against uh, capitalism, against yes. whatever have you. Uh, yes. Germans well, or... Now, of course, people, people have different values than they clash. That is the truism. But let me tell you, you mentioned nationalism. Let me make a statement to you. I don't believe nationalism is a um, form of um, de deprivation of liberty. Although some people would say it was because, for me, it depends whether nationalism is chauvinism or not. Nationalism simply means, well, we call it consciousness of nationality. People want to live with other people whose language they understand, whose habits are natural to them, so they don't have to explain things to them. People want to live among people with whom they can communicate without, so to speak, effort. And that is means to have a comfortable life. Hegel once said that freedom was by sich selbst sein, to be at home. That is a perfectly valid form of desire for living among your own people, and therefore a valid form of nationalism. Then there is a form of nationalism which says it is the only value. Everything else was bowed before it. Anything which prevents the development of a national state must go. That is wrong. That is, that is denial of the plurality of values. And more than that, if you would say, my nation is superior to your nation, therefore I know how you should live, and you don't know how I should live, and I'm going to conquer you in order to show you how life should be lived. That will do. But uh, nationhood or national uh, affiliation or the nation state are not as they were when they were created in the 19th century. I mean, we live in much more diverse societies with many cultures. Uh, and why not? And why not? What is wrong with it? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but perhaps nationalism or na uh, national affiliation will then be a, a value clashing with these... Uh, but all have values. Some values clash with other values, there's no doubt that the desire to live in a certain society um, will clash with the values of a man who says, I don't want to live in a society. I want to be a hermit. I want to live by myself. I'm not interested in politics. I'm not interested in, in talking to, to um, social life. I just want to sit in a room and listen to gramophone records. And I don't want it, anyone to come and call on me. I just want them to leave me food outside my room that I can eat. That would be a clash between two different concepts of life. But couldn't this then lead to what many people fear will happen, a, a tribalistic society with everyone uh, going to, uh, getting together with their kins, maybe quite a few because society is so diverse and they create their own mini society where they feel comfortable, listen to the same music, eat the same food, yes. and we'll have uh, the medievals back again with uh, you know small fortresses where people will Oh, but the middle trouble with the Middle Ages was a lot of dogmatism. People were not allowed not to be Christians. People were not allowed not not to live a certain kind of life. Not not to go to, not not go to church. Not to believe in certain values. I didn't mean that. If we have a lot of small societies, each of which is quite comfortable within itself, and they don't go to war against each other, because they understand the plurality of values, and that not all values are theirs then all is well. I don't think this could happen. I'm being optimistic. That's the many flowers which Mao talked about. That's what Herda wanted. He wanted societies which were comfortable among themselves, but which congratulated other societies on being comfortable among themselves with quite different values. And no conflict. That is optimistic. That is not what has happened. But ideally, it was a good state of affairs. I think today there is a better understanding of the need for a degree of toleration than there used to be. Because people are less certain that their form of life is the only rational, valid, correct form of life, and that it must therefore be either taught or enforced. Taught to or enforced on others. That's what the 18th century believed. That's what the great Philosophers believed. They knew what the correct life was. And either people um, didn't accept it because it was stupid, 
in which there had to be taught, or they still didn't accept it, in which there had to be laws, or they still didn't accept it, in which there had to be force. We don't quite believe that as much now because of the awful things that have happened, because of fascism, and communism, and the rest of it. That the result of that is a certain understanding of the need to make room for people different from ourselves, provided they don't take too much of our room. How much is always an empirical question. Well, let, let me mention the word meaning. The word meaning, giving a meaning to, to, the, to, to, the, to a particular existence. Why do I lead my life here and, and under these circumstances, and what's the purpose of it all? I mean, not a final answer, but each individual, individual will search for something. I'm not going to answer that question for the following reason. I, don't know, I should not say something, quote, my favorite thinker, and this may shock you. My favorite thinker is the Russian revolutionary, Alexander Herzen, who I think got things right more, more frequently than people um, allow. He said, what is the purpose of life? He said, the purpose of life is life. That's what I believe. The purpose of life is not happiness. The purpose of life is not truth. The purpose of life is not security. These are important values. The purpose of life is to continue life. Yeah. To go on being alive. But it, enough people still must believe that their life is worth, uh, worth going on with. Uh, and that has, I guess, to do with, with how they view things. And I'm not saying that we are looking for the uh, one uh, truth, but, but the desire to find uh, uh, some, in this... Some in ultimate purpose. Some ultimate purpose. I don't believe that's exactly what I'm against. I believe that all search for a final solution to human ills, that there is one particular structure of life for everybody. If only we could get that, which would satisfy all the proper human um, needs and rights. That the search for that invariably leads to blood. I agree with you, but but still, you you don't fear that this desire, this uh... it's not as strong as it was. I'm in a mildly optimistic condition. I don't think I think we des I mean, the Ayatollahs may believe that. They believe it, and lots of people in, in Algiers may believe it. And some certainly some Muslims clearly do believe it, and no doubt there are neo-fascists and um, there probably are unreconstructed. The communists, all we know, somewhere in Cuba, <laughs> who may believe this, but they don't believe it as strongly as they did. There is more. I mean, I'm optimistic because I think the idea that people must mustn't impose themselves too strongly on other people, that people should try and seek some protect their form of life, but not too strongly, not so strongly as to suppress other people. That is more better understood now than for a long, long time. But considering uh, this, your liberalism then, what, how would you say the, the frontiers or the, the barriers around the individual, uh, how, f how, how, f how firm should they be and where should they be placed? I can't answer, possibly, can't answer the question. How much right, what right have I got not to be interfered with by you? Well, some rights, but not all. Who can tell? Benjamin Constant was very good on that subject. You see, who said on the whole, the idea of individual liberty is a modern invention. The Greeks didn't believe it. They thought liberty meant ability to make speeches in the public assembly. <coughs> what have you? Have everyone an equal right to interfere with the lives of all the others. But that's the difference of liberty. We believe that everyone is entitled to some degree of privacy. If you say, how much? How can I answer? And you also say that not only that the idea of liberty of this kind is new, it's a 19th century idea, but you also say that uh, this might not uh, be put uh, on the top of an individual's agenda. Freedom is not maybe the big thing he is or she is looking for. They would look for material well-being, for a certain uh, peace of mind, uh, for something else. <coughs> Very true. What of that? And people seek different ideals. That is all I want to say. There are many incompatible values. They cannot be combined. In order to choose one value, you have to sacrifice others. Sacrifice is always painful, but there is no escaping it. 
and there is no ex escaping. It's, this is also what you're saying. There is no escaping the choice, the fact, the fact of that you have to choose. That is part of the human condition. That's what you asked me at the beginning. You said, what is the human condition to be able to choose? And that is nothing we choose ourselves, but that is coming with being a human being. Yes, it's part of what is we human. Part of the definition of being human, certainly. So let's just summarize in saying that. You believe that uh, this new understanding of value pluralism will, at least in Europe or in the Western world, stand out well against all new dreams of ultimate uh, truth I or utopias. So. I hope so. I can't say more. It hasn't been in the past. If it happens, it'll be a new thing. I hope so very strongly. But hope is hope. Hope, hope is not um, um, belief in probability. Um, I can only say, I hope so, otherwise human beings are doomed to a lot of unnecessary suffering. Avoidable suffering is what has to be avoided.